Good morning and welcome to class 11 of Developmental Psychology, Site 250 at NDSU, Summer Semester 2017. Today we're moving into middle childhood, so we're, we're moving pretty quickly through the developmental lifespan. We've got middle childhood for the rest of this week, and then next week um, we'll have the start of adolescence, and then we'll move into adulthood soon after. So we're just kind of we're just kind of clocking through. So um, hang on. If you're exhausted, that's why I know I'm exhausted. Um, just as a heads up, we won't have any video this week um, of me. I forgot to mention this last time. I'm working at home this week because I'm trying to get my apartment packed up. <clears throat> so um, I don't have a webcam at home. So. Uh, that's why. But, it, you know, it's kind of nice. That's one of the things I like about teaching online is if I want to just, like, chill in my pajamas and teach, I can do that. And, like, it's really amazing. And if you want to sit in your pajamas and do the class, then you can do that as well. So, sort of like we're having a pajama party, but not officially because that might be unprofessional. <laughs> but if we want to pretend to make it more fun, we can do that. <laughs> um... So I wanted to just go over some housekeeping before we get started. Um, good job, everyone, on getting the quiz done. There's one person who still hasn't done it, so be sure to get that done by 11.59 tonight. Um, good job on your discussion boards. I've noticed a couple people like are missing some classes, and that's fine. You can miss up to four classes. Um, I do put in the comments, though, if you're missing a class, and that's just for you and for me so that I can keep track of it. Um, it's not a judgment. So if you needed to miss a class for whatever reason, that's fine. I just um, wanted to make sure that you knew that's why I put that in there. Um, looking at our syllabus, uh, just a reminder that our midterm exam is on Friday. Um, so we won't have a lecture. You'll have all day from 11.59 on Thursday, 11.59 p.m. on Thursday to 11.59 on Friday to complete the exam online. It is open book, open notes. <clears throat> so um, be sure to um, study for that. I've posted study materials on Blackboard. Um, we will have a review session on campus at um, 5 p.m. from 5 to 6 in the Menard 232 in the Psychology Conference Room. If you can come to that, you're welcome to come. If you do attend, you get one extra credit point. Now, I understand that because this is a distance class, a lot of people are unable to attend things that they would like to, so um, I've created a Google Hangout for the class, and we'll, I will be broadcasting the um, review session via um, um, Hangout. So if you've never used Hangout before, um, you should go to the Blackboard page for the exams and the ex midterm exam. There's instructions on how to join the Hangout. You'll want to make sure that you've downloaded the required software beforehand. It's really simple. It's just a plug-in. Um, it's, it's free. Um, so just if you want to do that, just be mindful that you need to do that beforehand because if you wait until 5 o'clock, you're going to end up missing half of the review. If you do attend by the, um, by, uh, on the Internet, so if you come via Hangouts, then you'll also get an extra credit point. And then there's a discussion board for you to ask questions about the class, <clears throat> the different classes, the different materials that will be on the exam. And you can get half a point for asking a question, half a point for responding to a question. And so you could get up to two extra credit points if you participate in the discussion board and you also come to the review. And all that's applied to your, um, your midterm exam. Just as a, you know, just FYI, um, the, the exam is worth 50 points and you'll probably, I think you can get up to five extra credit points. So that's a whole letter grade. So doing the extra credit will actually benefit you in, in really wonderful ways. Um, so just putting that out there. Uh, some people didn't participate in extra credit last year or last semester and were really disappointed in their grades. So uh, just putting that out there. The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is I have created a discussion board for, um, <clears throat> for the... Um, um, I'm tired. Give me a second. 
<laughs> I've only had a quarter of a Diet Coke this morning, so I'm, I'm literally dying. Um, for the movie night, so if you participate in the movie night extra credit, you have to attend, um, or you have to participate in the, in the discussion board in order to get um, the extra credit point. So if you go to the blackboard and you come down to opportunities for further learning and you click it, you'll scroll all the way to the bottom and you'll see a movie night response forum and so you'll just go into that and you'll notice I've created four questions for Boys Don't Cry. And so what you'll need to do is click into the question, read the question, and then click reply. And then type your response to that question. Okay? So don't so don't make your own question, like your own thread, just reply to this thread right here. Um, for each of these questions that you um, respond to, <clears throat> you'll um, receive um, for each of these questions that you reply to, you'll receive a quarter of a point. So it's one point total if you do all of these questions. And it's, there's not, I mean, there is a right or wrong answer potentially. They're all sort of abstract questions. So there is a right or wrong answer, um, but like you're not being graded on the accuracy of your response. You're just being graded on whether or not you do it. So obviously do something thoughtful, but you don't have to like worry about getting it absolutely right. Um, you can reply to other people's responses if you want to. It's definitely not required. Um, it's definitely not required. But if you want to um, impress me with your intelligence, then you can always do that by replying <laughs> to other people. And it, it also, I just like, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I like watching um, you all reply to each other because this class isn't as fun, I think, if you don't build relationships with each other. So please re feel free to reply if you want to. So as I said, we're moving into, oh, and before I do that, if you have any questions about the questions or about movie nights in general, please feel free to reach out um, by email. I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to respond um, and to help in any way. And the other bit of housekeeping I want to say before um, we start class, and you're like, okay, Darcy, can we move on, <laughs> is... Uh, I'm just trying to collect my thoughts this morning, um, is because I'm working at home, the internet here is a lot slower than at NDSU, believe it or not. Um, uh, you know, the budget cuts, our internet has gotten really awful at the university, but it's it's apparently worse here. It, it takes about 15 minutes for me to load a video to YouTube at the office, and it takes about 40 minutes to do it here. So I would say you're probably going to, your best bet is probably going to be to check about noon to see if the lecture has been loaded. I'm going to try my best to have it up by, uh, by 11, but the reality is that I just probably won't. So um, if you come and it's not, the link will be there by 11. And if you click it and it says this video is still processing or we can't find this video, it's because YouTube's still processing it. So don't, don't despair. Just go away and come back and maybe it'll be fixed. <clears throat> okay. And then the other thing, I have a list here, I have a sticky note that I was like trying to remember things. Um, a lot of people have been emailing me saying that the links don't work. Um, and it's, it's puzzling because I click the links and they work. And so I end up just copying and pasting them into an email and sending them to you which is a little bit like it's, it's extra work for me and it's a little frustrating. So I think just what you should do if your links are not working is try copying and pasting the link into the browser. Instead of clicking it, just copy and paste it into the browser. Um, I'm going to, instead of putting the links in the PowerPoints and then you have to type them out, I'm going to just put the links in the, the module on, on Blackboard so you can just click them. 
um, and I check them to make sure that they work. So if for some reason it's not working for you, just copy and paste it and see if that works. Maybe just part of the video isn't <clears throat> working. And you know what else I could probably do? I don't know. If I don't know how YouTube feels about this, but I can just do all. I can copy and paste the links into the into the YouTube video as well, like into the, the, the description of the YouTube video. I think that would work. I'll, I'll give you multiple options by which you can try to access them so that I'm not having to copy and paste them. Because the, the problem is, if I don't, if I'm not at a computer, I can't. There's, I'm limited in what I can do for my phone, and I don't have access to the to the stuff at home a lot. So I have to like go to the office or actually like remotely access my desktop at work from home. So <clears throat> just try those different steps to see if that works so that then we're not, <clears throat> neither one of us are wasting a lot of time. All right, let's get started with class. And today's class will be a little bit shorter. It'll be 50 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me, good grief. It will be a little bit shorter, and the reality is because I probably could have combined this class with the next one. I did not teach the next class, uh, class 12, last semester because I was um, at a job interview, and so I didn't really, I didn't really know how long it would take. So that's why I didn't combine them. So this will be a shorter class, but that's good. You can have the rest of the day to just kind of relax. So today we're going to be talking about physical and cognitive development in middle childhood. And we'll start with physical development. So in terms of body growth, we see some pretty fast growth um, throughout middle childhood. So the average weight is about 45 pounds, and the average height is about three and a half feet tall. Um, you will expect, though, from a child in middle childhood to see um, growth of about five pounds each year. And so middle childhood is like age seven to twelve. No, nope, 9 to 11. I was wrong. <laughs> Early childhood is 3 to 8. Middle childhood is 9 to 11. So, we're looking at about 10 to 15 pounds. Uh, yes, yeah, 10 to 15 pounds in growth. And then about 9, up to 9 inches um, in, in height over this, this middle childhood era. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the physical characteristics we see with children in middle childhood, um, they tend to be long-legged and highly flexible. So um, one description of children at this age is that they're all legs, and that's because we see a lot of leg growth. Um, and they're also very flexible, so um, they're able to do stretches that, that that no human being should ever be able to do. Um, <clears throat> and um, part of this is to aid with the, the physical growth that they're going to. Also, it's to uh, protect them from injury. <clears throat> we also see girls transition from being shorter than boys to being taller than boys. So, ladies, this is the only time in our lives where we actually exceed boys in something. So... We have to embrace this time of our lives because it's the only time we're going to be ahead. We do see some health problems um, that are pretty prevalent in this time period. So myopia, so that's nearsightedness, um, affects 25% of children. So this is if, if you're going to need glasses, if you're myopic or nearsighted, this is about the time when you'll see that emerge. Uh, middle ear infections are also pretty prevalent. Um, they occur in about 3 to 4 percent of middle to high SES. Remember, SES or socioeconomic um, <clears throat> scale or status. This is your, your income and social standing rating. And so people who are, are in the middle class or the upper class um, 
about 3 to 4 percent experience middle ear infections, 20 percent of low SES, so working class children, experience um, middle ear infections that lead to hearing problems or loss. <clears throat> Obesity is another really big issue in the U.S. when it comes to children and childhood diseases. Um, obesity is defined as a body mass index that's greater than 20% over your healthy weight. So in other words, your, your fat to muscle ratio is 20% greater than it should be at a healthy weight. And so this, per, this affects 32% of children. Um, <clears throat> so, the, so, sorry, weight problems can affect children, 32% of children affected by weight problems are overweight, um, or 32% of children in total um, are overweight. So they have a BMI or body mass index that's greater than the 85th percentile. So that means that 85% of children below them um, are that their weight is greater than 85% of the kids, the children um, who weigh less than them. 11% of children are actually obese, so they do have that 20% increase over healthy weight, and they have a, they are, have a body mass index of 95, uh, greater than 95th percentile, meaning 95% um, of children beneath them, or 95% <clears throat> of the children that exist in the world have a weight less than theirs. Both being overweight and being obese can lead to major health problems and psychosocial problems that emerge later in childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. And so <clears throat> we often think about the physical issues that stem from being overweight and obese, <clears throat> such as heart issues, diabetes, blood pressure, um, high blood pressure, uh, sleep apnea, um, joint and joint issues like knees and um, hips can go out because of weight, um, but we don't think a lot of times about psychosocial problems. So, feeling depressed, feeling um, feelings of body dysmorphia, um, eating disorders can come as a result of obesity and being overweight. If you're feeling that you're inadequate in some way. Um, depression, feelings of shame. We live in a society that values thinness, so people who aren't thin um, oftentimes feel out of place and unwanted and unimportant and, and ugly and unlovable, and that can cause a lot of really serious psychological issues for a person over the course of their lifetime. Um, <clears throat> now, this is not to say that this 32% of children who are overweight are like children who are stocky, or what we would define as stocky. So everybody's body is different. No one is supposed to be the size of a pencil. Um, this just means that when you look at, when we're figuring out if someone is overweight or obese, we're looking at percentile ranks. And so we're looking to see, okay, how many people, how many of children can be categorized lower of lower weight? And so 85th percentile, that means that 85% or 95% or of people are way less than you do. So that means that you're very much up there in terms of how much you weigh. And so it, this does not mean an overweight child is not a child who's a little bit chunky. Like that's normal and, and actually we'll talk about that uh, when it comes to puberty. You, the reason especially girls are chunkier um, in this time period is they're, they're preparing for puberty, for being able to reproduce, and women need to have more fat in order to reproduce healthily and safely. So, <clears throat> um, the problem that we have with obesity in the United States is not, has nothing to do with a child being a little chunky. Um, it has everything to do with the child not being healthy. And so when we talk about weight issues in this class, we're talking about health. We're not talking about appearance. Chronic illness is also a common problem that starts to um, rear its ugly head in middle childhood. So um, there is a high rate of chronic illness in early middle childhood. So the 
um, you know, the first couple of years. Um, about 5 to 20 percent of children in middle childhood have some kind of chronic illness in early middle childhood. Um, so chronic, just to define that, that is a persistent illness that lasts in duration longer than like maybe a month. Uh, so this is an illness that, that causes some kind of long-term issue. It doesn't have to be lifelong. It can just be something that lasts for a while. Um, <clears throat> for example, a cold is like an acute illness. That's something that lasts a short period of time. Asthma, though, would be an example of a chronic illness. This is something that lasts for a lifetime. It could last for part of a lifetime. It could develop later in life. Um, I didn't develop asthma until I was uh, in college. So it's chronic in that it's persistent, but it's not necessarily a lifetime disease. Um, asthma is probably the most common chronic illness in early childhood or early middle childhood with one third of chronic illnesses. Um, reported being asthma. Um, only about 2% though, so this is a good, a good percentage rate, only 2% develop a severe chronic illness like cystic fibrosis. Um, <clears throat> unintentional injuries also are a major issue in terms of health when it, when it comes to development in middle childhood. Um, they account for most hospital and clinic visits for children in this age range. Um, the most common are vehicle and bike accidents. So um, either the child um, is, a, is a passenger in a vehicle and they're in a, in a car accident, and part of the problem for this is, well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you. For extra credit, for a quarter of extra credit on your participation for your discussion board this week, uh, tell me, why do you think... Um, children in middle childhood are at more risk for vehicle accidents as passengers than they would be as an early child in early childhood or an adolescent. And then the other a way that a vehicle could be the attribution for the unintentional injury is pedestrian, so kids running out in the street, um, getting hit by a car. And then bike, obviously, like you're riding a bike, you're riding it all over the place, you might ride into, into oncoming traffic or you might fall off of it. Boys are especially at risk, and a lot of this is because boys tend to be more reckless than girls, and they also tend to have a little bit less supervision than girls, and so they'll take risks, and <clears throat> that's probably why they're, ris they're a lot riskier than girls, because they're unsupervised. No one's checking their behavior. <clears throat> this unintentional injury rate continues to increase in adolescence, so... Actually, vehicle accidents as passengers and drivers increase in adolescence. So tell me for extra credit why, why middle children are at higher risk of being injured in, as a passenger in a vehicle than early children. We start to see really good, really fast, really large gains in motor development. Um, and these major gains occur in four basic motor capacities, flexibility, um, balance, agility, and force. So flexibility, so the ability to bend and um, contort. Balance, uh, the ability to <clears throat> do things without falling. Agility, the ability to do things um, quickly and uh, I'm trying to think of like a good way to describe agility without saying agile. Um, quickly and easy. So, you know, if you're, you know those, you watch those videos of somebody and they're, they're doing their physical therapy, but they're, they're doing their exercises and they have those tires that are laid out and they have to like do their, like hopscotch through the tires, that would be agility. Um, the ability to do that quickly and efficiently. And then force, like the strength with which you do something. Um, school children have a much quicker reaction time than preschoolers, so if you throw something at them, they're more likely to catch it than if they're in early childhood. Um, and part of the reason we see such huge gro um, growth in these gross motor skills is we see um, we see uh, uh, group activities and outdoor play and greater rates and greater numbers during this time period, and so these activities really facilitate flexibility, balance, agility, and force. 
fine motor skills also see great gains during this period um, in terms of writing. Children um, by the age of six can print the alphabet and write numbers with clarity, and so um, the ability to write greatly increases one's fine motor skills because that writing is the ultimate fine motor skill. And so um, in this period from six to seven to eight, children are writing a lot because they're learning their alphabet, they're learning to write, and so every day they see better, you know, better increases, they see better agility at writing, better um, accuracy. <clears throat> However, we do see with children in this period letters that are very big, um, and part of that, and I wish that this is one of those times when having a webcam would be really great, but children in this time period use their whole arm to write. Um, so everybody do this with me. Get a pen, and I want you to write the first letter of your name, but instead of writing with your wrist, so where you're, you, the movement is all in your wrist. So like if I was to write and all the movement was in my wrist, this is what it would look like. See? Um, it's all in the wrist. I want you to use your elbow as the pivot point for, your, um, for what you're writing. So don't move your wrist. Keep your wrist, your wrist straight. Use your elbow as sort of the, the pivot, the, the part of your body, that, of your arm that moves. So take the pen in your hand, and I want you to hold your art, your wrist straight and pivot with your elbow and write the first letter of your name. So if you're doing the, if you're moving with your elbow, it's going to be a lot bigger because you're not as it's not as fine tuned um, or as as refined or as as fine. It's a fine motor skill. It's not as fine as if you were using your wrist. So if you're writing with your elbow, you're going to have bigger letters. Um, as we get older, though, in, in middle childhood, writing becomes clearer and smaller. And so it's really big, really chunky at first, but it does get smaller as your, your wrist becomes the primary um, pivot point in your writing. Drawing also starts to sophisticate during middle childhood. So we see 2D objects becoming more realistic. So an apple looks like an apple and not like a squiggle um, or a rotten apple. And then rudimentary 3D perspective enters pictures. So we start to see some 3D orientation within the picture. It's not good. It's not perfect, but it's you know there is some perspective. There's not. It's not just 2D. And so here's an example. Um, see these huge block letters because we've got some elbow action going on here. <clears throat> and then if you look at this picture, you can start to see some 2D or some 3D. So like, obviously, if you had a piece of furniture that looked like this, you, it, you know, it's probably going to be falling apart quickly. It's like you went to Ikea and you bought something didn't quite put it together um, accurately. But you see there's some perspective. Like you can kind of see this is a sink that has some, some depth to it. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> the same with this, uh, this little hospital bed here. And then we see, if you look at this, some two-dimensional um, aspect right here, like that looks like a face. Um, this looks like a stethoscope. Um, these signs, these like fruits on the signs and vegetables on the signs look accurate. So much better than those pictures that we looked at before where it's like, well, it's a squiggle with an ugly face, on, like a mean face on it. So... What is that? I'm not sure. Um, by the way, I enjoyed reading your interpretations. Of, if Brian is the kid who drew the picture, but I appreciated your um, descriptions. They made me laugh. We still see gender differences emerge um, during middle childhood, and not necessarily emerge, but also just maintain. Um, boys continue to be better at most gross motor skills. Um, the difference is girls are better at agility score, uh, sports. Girls tend to be much more agile than boys. Um, boys are much better at throwing and kicking, um, and part of that is because boys use a lot more force than girls do. Girls, though, are better at drawing and writing, which are fi fine motor skills. So we see those those differences that emerged in early childhood in terms of gross and fine motor skills really maintain themselves.
And the question is really why? Why do we continue to see these differences? Is it some kind of intrinsic difference? Is it, um, <clears throat> you know, what is it? Well, they're not due to physical differences. Boys and girls um, in middle childhood have not gone through puberty yet. Their bodies are virtually identical in terms of um, muscle composition, in terms of um, hormone structure. There's, no, there's nothing really physically different. Now, girls are taller, um, granted, but there really isn't a huge difference. We don't really see huge capacity differences. <clears throat> so the, the reason that we have these differences in, in fine and gross motor skills is socialization. Um, parents and coaches at school encourage boys to engage in more strenuous play. So if you're, you know, encouraged on the playground to go running and climbing and, and, and you're doing that and you're literally lifting yourself up onto the jungle gym like 50 times in a one, in like a 30 minute recess period, you're going to develop more muscle mass. You're going to develop more endurance. Um, the more that you develop muscle mass and endurance, the more force you're going to use with things. Um, on the other hand, think about what girls are encouraged to do on the playground. Playing hopscotch, jumping rope, playing in the sand. Um, a lot of, I remember growing up, because I always you know, wanted to hang out with the girls, but you know, I kind of had to find the balance where I was hanging out with boys and girls. And I was really lucky that a lot of my girlfriends and, um, <clears throat> you know, not girlfriend, girlfriend, not like me, like me girlfriends, but just like, like lady friends. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of lady friends because I'm all about I'm all about the ladies, um, but um, <clears throat> I remember like a lot of the girls like there there would be those girls who are kind of like gender non-conforming and would be much more like active and like would run around and and later actually it's funny they they were the girls in high school middle school and high school who who did women's sports. But um, you'd have those other girls who were the more dainty girls, and they would just kind of, their games would be very social in nature. Like, they'd involve sitting in a circle, playing, like, pat a, like, pat a cake or other, like, hand games, and, um, or building, like, stuff in the sandbox, or we didn't really have a sandbox in elementary school, but it was a lot of, like, socialization-type games. There weren't a lot of, like, strenuous activity games, and so... You think about that, and you think about that the effect that that has on a person's physical development, physical growth. It's not that, that girls are less strong than boys. It's just that they haven't had a lifetime of conditioning to the point that they are able to engage in more strenuous activity in the same way that boys and girls are, or the way that boys are. And actually, if we look at, like, Female athletes and, and their endurance and their performance, they perform just as well as guys do. Um, they, you know, I, I won't go so far because I'm not an expert in this and I don't want to speak for female athletes, but, I, you know, I, I would say that girls could pr most likely compete fairly against boys. It would be a little bit more difficult, though, I think, because guys do have... The, the strength training that guys go through, and, and from my limited experience, so if you're a female athlete, you are more than welcome to say, Darcy, you have no idea what you're talking about, so shut up. But, like, most of the the, the strength training and endurance training for guy athletes is, is a lot more, it's very, it's, it's much more strenuous, and it has been so for a longer period of time. So it's not that girls would not be able to keep up, it's just that um, the training is different. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I had a ton of female athletes in my class last semester. In fact, they invited me to come to their games, and I was just blown away by how amazing, like, I, I've always enjoyed women's sports more than men's sports because it's just, I don't know, women, I think women, and maybe I'm wrong on this too. I've never been on a sports team, a, a women's sports team, but it just seems to me, just based on my experience on men's sports teams, that, that there's a lot more camaraderie, a lot more, like, friendly, supportive camaraderie on a women's sports team. It's like you get the best of both worlds. You've got the, the girl, like, the, the ladies who are <clears throat> incredibly athletic, 
but they've also been socialized to be more social and more supportive of each other. And so it's like you get this really cool combination. I just love I mean, I went to the girls' softball game um, last semester, and I wanted to be on the team. Like, I was jealous. I was like, I want to be a softball player. I mean, I don't want to play softball, but I want to be on the team because it looks like fun, and they have all have these little chants with each other, and, like, they eat, literally each girl has their own chant. Um, that the team does while they're like they're they're hitting the sports ball, and I just thought it was really cool. And I was like, I want to do that. That seems like a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so the point being that we see these gender differences, but most of it is due to socialization, and not not at all to physical differences. But when I say not due to physical differences, not not due to some intrinsic intrinsic physical difference. Now. We do, over time, see physical differences because of the way that we socialize people. So that, that's important to remember. For your discussion for today, um, on week three discussion board, subject class 11, um, when you were in elementary school, did you have a collection? And you're going to be like, what does that have to do with anything, Darcy? Well, you'll find out in just a minute if you just trust me. So tell me about your elementary school collection, and I'll tell you about mine really fast um, while you're writing this down. So when I was in elementary school, I collected quarters, and that was the year that the state quarters came out. Do you, 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 surely, you surely know what the state quarters are, so let me, let me just find one. Um, <clears throat> when I was in elementary school, the 50 state quarters came out, and the, the, the U.S. Mint released these, um, these quarters for each state, and they came out over like a, I want to say, five or six year period, so a couple were released every year, and um, I collected them because I did. I don't really know why, but I collected them, and I had this little map. I had this map of the United States with a slot for each quarter, and I would literally, like, when they would come out, would collect them and then um, put them out there. Um, so that's the one for North Dakota, and then they have, like, the name of the state on there, um, and then the year it was um, made a state. So and then the year it came out. So this came out in 2006. So I was in high school when that came out. Um, so I must have collected these through longer than just uh, middle childhood, but I started it in elementary school. And then, you know what I did? <clears throat> I, after fin I finished collecting them, um, was like, you know, this was really a big waste of time because I was in high school at the time. I was like, what a waste of time. So I literally cashed in all my coins because I was like, um, I've got better things to do with my life. And you know what? How You know how much money I got out of that? Like, I was sitting here thinking, oh, all these years of collecting, I'm going to have all this money. Well, quarters are 25 cents and they're 50 states. So I literally got 12.50 out of this. Like, I collected these quarters for, like, <clears throat> God knows how long, and it was only a $12.50 investment. Like, what a waste. <clears throat> what a literal waste of time. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so that's, that's how I feel about this. I found the map that I used to have, so I'm going to post this on here so you can just, like... can get a, a, a picture of what my elementary school li life was like. So this was my map. It was on the wall of my bedroom. And so, like, each state had the year on there, and you just literally stick that mug in there. Also, they had the, the golden dollar. You remember when the, the, the Sacagawea golden dollar came out? Like, everyone was like, oh, golden dollar, it's so cool. And then, like, they just didn't really take off. Which I think is funny, like, in every other country in the world, like, they don't have, like, a one dollar or, or one, like, euro or a one whatever. Like, they don't have a one, the one denomination paper, like, note. They have a coin. And it makes so much more sen sense because those one dollar bills wear out so fast because they're the most, one of the most used, I think they are the most used, um, 
denomination of bill. And you would think that the that the U.S. Mint would like just decide to get rid of the paper dollar and just make a dollar coin because then they would last longer and they wouldn't be reprinting them every five minutes. So like, I don't understand. Though they didn't ask me either. If you go to Canada, they have a one dollar and a two dollar coin, and they're called. They've got loons on them. It's like a loon is a bird, and so they have the one dollar coin. It's called a loony. And the $2 bill is called a toonie because it's, it's two loons. Isn't that amazing? You're like, Darcy, that's like so ridiculous. Like, why are you telling us this? Well, I just think it's cool. And you know what? We're only, you know, if you're in Fargo, only two hours from Canada. If you're in Grand Forks, only an hour from Canada. You should totally go because it's a really cool country. You should, you should go. I mean, I'm just telling you. You know, I can't force you to go, but I, I, I do think that you should consider it, um, because, you know, it would be a fun little trip. They have a, if you like human rights, um, they have a human rights museum, that's a, that's a loony, see it's got a, the loon on it, um, the little mug right there, and let me find a toonie for you, and you're like, Darcy, just move on with your life. Um... Oh, I feel so lied to. The toonie doesn't have a hasn't have a loon on it. I I I'm sad. I guess they just call it a toonie because the one is called a loony, but that's still sad. But it's got a bear on it. It's got a polar bear on it. It's not a cute little cute little mug. Little yogi bear. <clears throat> you should go to Canada though. I'm gonna try to go before I move. I have a passport and everything. I am ready to go. Alright. So let's move into cognitive development. During middle childhood, Piaget says we're in the concrete operational stage. And this is a more logical and flexible and organized um, uh, mode of being and of thinking. Um, and there are two key areas in which people in the concrete operational stage um, develop. The first is in conservation, and we talked about this in early childhood, how children in early childhood have difficulties with conservation. They have a hard time conserving information. And actually, Darcy with an I asked a really good question about how do you tell the difference between concentrate or centration and conservation? And I want to address that because I think it's a really good question. So conservation is the ability to conserve, to remember, to store information about the characteristics of an object. So in other words, if you have two glasses of water and the glasses are identical and they both have the same amount of water in them, we as adults can conserve that information when you pour water from one glass into a different size glass and suddenly the level of water is different. We can conserve the volume of that of that glass of water. We know that it's the same amount because we're able to conserve, to hold in our memory, the volume, that the volume is the same. But children in early childhood cannot. They cannot conserve, they cannot store in their, in their working memory the knowledge that that volume of water is the same. They can only go off of what they see. Centration is only focusing on one characteristic. So in other words, focusing on the, the, the level of water rather than the volume would be centration or the number of coins, the, the length of the line of coins rather than the number. Okay, so in the coin tap, which is what I gave as an example of centration, there's also a conservation error there as well. The child is unable to conserve, to retain in their memory, the number of coins. But they're also so focused on the fact that the coins are different lengths, the, the line of coins are different lengths. They're not focusing on the, the bigger picture, which is that the, the number is the same. But when we move into middle childhood, <clears throat> there is conservation um, gains. So um, children in this stage are, are more operational. They're able to follow logical rules. And so they can look at a glass, two glasses of water and say, okay, if I pour this glass, glass A, into glass C, and glass C is a tumbler instead of a cooler. So a cooler being a large, like, 16-ounce glass, a tumbler being a 5-ounce glass. If I pour 
six ounces of water from the cooler into the eight ounce tumbler, it's going to look like there's more water in the tumbler, but the reality is the volume is the same. So it's the same amount of water. So they're able to be operational and that they can follow these rules. They're also able to engage in reversibility. So they can think through a series of steps from start to finish and then from finish to start. So they can say, okay, to get dressed this morning, I need to get my underwear, my pants, my socks, and my shirt and put all of them on. And then when I get home, I need to, to take off my shirt, my pants, my underwear, and my socks. They can make that, they can, they can talk about the steps that they have to take for a task in the same, in either order from start to finish or from finish to start. <clears throat> we also add a new, a new cognitive skill, and that's classification. So you remember we talked about in early childhood that children in this period have a hard time classifying things in a complex way. So they can't say that you know roses and daffodils are both flowers because they both look different. And that the fact that they look different keeps them from being able to classify them. But in middle childhood, we see more sophisticated awareness of classification. There's awareness of categories and of hierarchies and of subcategories. So for example, they can categorize, they can have a category of bears that is a larger, you know, the larger, broader category. And then the, the subcategory of like brown bears, black bears, white bears, um, koala, I mean, koalas are, well, they're not. They're actually they're marsupials, but <laughs> but you know we 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 classify pandas and koalas as bears, but they don't look like polar bears or black bears or even grizzly bears. So like children in middle childhood are able to grasp the idea that you can have a larger category and then you can put people or you can put objects into subcategories or hierarchies under that. And as as an outcome of this, children in middle childhood have collections of stamps, baseball cards, Pokemon cards, quarters. Um, I had a student last semester who collected shot glasses. Or was it shot glass? No, it was tiny spoons. You know those little tiny spoons? They had this huge collection of tiny spoons. And I was like, that's adorable. Like, can we have a tiny spoon party and all come to your apartment and have, like, cake and eat it with these tiny spoons? Um, Children at this age like having collections. They like categorizing things because they're very comfortable with thinking about things in that way. We also see during this period seriation, the ability to order items along a quantitative dimension, so length and weight. So we can we can say, okay, let's let's arrange all all U.S. currency in order of size, and so we would have. Um, you know, we would start with the dime. The dime is the smallest, the smallest U.S. coin. Sorry, I'm looking at, I'm finding a picture, because I like pictures. You're like, we know. <laughs> um... Sort of perfect. Okay. So let's order items along a quantitative dimension. So in this picture, the quantitative dimension is the the value. So a penny is the lowest valued quarter in the um, in the um, coin in the US coins and so it'll be first. And then the nickel is the next the next highest valued coin. And then the dime and then the quarter and then the half dollar. You're like, there's a half dollar? Yeah. There's a quarter dollar and a half dollar coin. And there's also a, a dollar coin. <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah, we have all these did you know there's a two dollar bill? There is such a thing as a two dollar bill. You should look it up. Now, if we could think of it, we could put this in a, so this is a series, and we could put this in a different order. We could put the dime first, because it's the smallest, and then the, nick, the penny, and then the nickel, and then the quarter dollar, and then the half dollar. Um, we could reverse the order, um, because we're putting stuff in series, and we could, we could literally reverse the order and say, okay, 
um, we'll start with the biggest and work our way down in value, work our way down to the smallest in value, or we could, you know, reverse it and put the, you know, the dime first and have it in order of size. And so that is, that is seriation, and children are able, and middle childhood are able to do that. We also see seriation occurring through transitive inference. And this is when we're able to mentally order things. We're not actually having to have things in front of us or having to say it out loud. We're able to orderly put things in an order on a quantitative dimension in our mind without having to think about it. And just to give you an example of transitive inference, I want you now to put, um, put all of the U.S. dollar all the U.S. dollar bills, so the, the paper money, put that in order from smallest to largest. And so here, I'm not looking at a picture or anything. I'm just going to do it for you right now. If we're putting it from smallest to largest, we'd have a $1 bill, a $2 bill, a $5 bill, a $10 bill, a $20 bill. $50 bill and a $100 bill. I just did all that. I put that in order using our, my, men, my mental capacity without having to, um, you know, without having to write it down, without having to look at a picture. Now, I did say it out loud, so that that is a little bit different. I mean, but I, I put it in my mind's eye before I said it out loud. That is transitive inference. We also see gains in spatial reasoning. The ability to think about the world, think about the physical world, and reason it out. So we do this through many different ways in middle childhood. The first is through cognitive maps, and these are mental representations of familiar large-scale spaces, such as your neighborhood or your school. So if I were to tell you to draw me, uh, well, it's hard to, to do this because I don't know if you've been, actually been to NDSU. I want you to draw me a map from your house to the closest convenience store where you can buy me a Diet Coke and a candy bar. That is your assignment. So you hopefully can all do that. You can draw a map in a smaller scale of a familiar, of a familiar, familiar place. Another form of spatial reasoning that children in middle childhood can engage in is um, in creating highly organized and clear instructions. So if I were to tell you or to tell a middle child, person in middle childhood to tell me how to um, tell me how to make a pop tart, which I think is something that everybody in middle childhood should be able to do, make a pop tart. I'd say do the laundry, but I don't know what children do these days. I could do laundry when I was in middle childhood, but I also grew up really poor and my mom was like, you have to do your own laundry. <laughs> um, there's also an awareness of scale that develops later in middle childhood, so towards adolescence. Scale is the idea that you can take a large item and you can draw it in a smaller way, and that's, that's scaling something. Now, we have all of these huge gains in cognition. There's a limitation, though, according to Piaget, and this is that these gains apply only to concrete information. So when I talk about, and I've talked about this before, but when I talk about concrete information, I'm talking about things that are tangible, that we can look at. So places, things, objects. The opposite of concrete is abstract. <clears throat> and abstract, abstract, abstract are things that are, that are not tangible or not necessarily tangible, like justice. Justice is concrete in the sense that we have a clear picture of what justice looks like, but justice really is more of an abstract concept. It's something that, that, we, that we can only reason in our mind. Children in middle childhood have difficulty with abstract ideas because it requires that you completely ignore the fact that it's not tangible. And children during this period are very, very tangibly oriented. From an information processing perspective, working memory capacity um, develops um, in really good ways. 
Um, so the time needed to complete cognitive tasks decreases. So in other words, we see an increase in working memory capacity, the ability of the chief executive to process information quickly. And as, and the, the, as we are able to process things quick, quicker, we're able to do things faster. In terms of that chief executive or the executive function, we see an ability to manage multiple tasks at once. In other words, we can pay attention to multiple things. We can read a book um, while also imagining the things that the character are doing in the book. We can hold a conversation with mom while we help her make cookies in the kitchen. And our attention also sees great increases. Um, we see attention become more selective. We're able to have many different things coming at us at once and we pick the thing that we want to talk about or think about. We see things become, attention becoming more adaptive. In other words, when you have distractions, the, your attention is able to come up with ways to focus on what you want to focus on without um, the distraction that is existing. And then planful, we're able to create some kind of plan of what we're going to attend to and how we're going to attend to it. We see improvements in the ability to pay attention to goal-oriented information. In other words, children during this period can set goals and then they can select they can select goals and then they can adapt their attention to make plans in order to meet these goals. Um, we also see improvements in planning and adapting this attention. So in other words, as we enter middle childhood, we're able in a much more sophisticated way to experience our world and our place within that world and to actually achieve things in our world based on our ability to take in information, attend to it, and, and, and use it in, in the form of a plan. And we see improvements also in memory strategies and in memory, and this really helps a great deal um, in the middle child's ability to, to have be more goal-oriented. Memory strategies are deliberate mental activities designed to store and retain information. And I'm sure all of you right now are utilizing memory strategies as you prepare for our exam that's on Friday. One form of one mental strategy is a rehearsal strategy, and this is when you're repeating information over and over again. So if you're doing flashcards, you're engaging in a rehearsal memory strategy. Organization is another memory strategy, and this is grouping related items together. So this would be, you could do this by doing flashcards, but then grouping the flashcards not by the chapter that they come in, but say you group all of the physical development flashcards together, all the cognitive development flashcards together, all of the, um, all of the um, um, social and emotional development flashcards together. All of that would be an example of organi organization. And then elaboration is creating shared meaning between information that's not in the same category. In other words, saying, well, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, I want to talk about um, physical development. I want to organize all this information about physical development. But it's different in each, in each time period. So I'm going to remember the way that people develop by creating some kind of shared meaning between all of this information. Or if it's not, you know, if the category, that, that's if the category was the, the, the developmental period. But if, say, we want to talk about the category being we want to combine information from cognitive and physical development into a single, and we want to remember things that way, what we can do is then talk about the development of physical structures that then enable cognitive development to occur. And that would be elaboration. We also see cognitive self-regulation becoming more prevalent during middle childhood. Cognitive self-regulation is the process of continuously monitoring progress towards a goal. In other words, being able to assess where we are within a set of, uh, set of steps or within a series of, of, of goals that we have. Um, and this is related to what's called academic self-efficacy, which is confidence in individual academic ability. And so we start to see 
academic self-efficacy really flourishing during middle childhood or not flourishing depending on the child um, because they're becoming more aware of, of their, their cognition, of their deficiencies or their um, the things that they're good at when it comes to um, um, cognition and so um, the ability to self-regulate where we are within a set of goals can affect our ability to identify how well we're doing. Along with information processing, we start to see difficulties with information processing that emerge during middle childhood. And probably the most prevalent is um, ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And ADHD is a psychological disorder and despite what people would say, it is not increasing. <laughs> it's not that we, we didn't have ADHD when I was a kid. The reality is we did have ADHD. We've had ADHD across an entire lifespan. We just didn't have a word for it. We didn't have a way to diagnose it, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. <clears throat> so there's not that, that the rate's increasing. It's, it's always been this, this way. We're just more aware of it. The same with autism. People like to talk about how we see this huge, we're seeing this huge increase in autism um, in the 21st century. The reality is, we're, while the numbers look like there's an increase, the reality is we had horrible diagnostic methods for autism 50 years ago. Um, really, even 10 years ago, we weren't very good at diagnosing autism. We're still not incredibly good at it. Um, but the rate is going up, or it appears to be going up, because we're more aware of it, because we have a better way of diagnosing it. It's not that it's never existed, that it's suddenly existing. It's that we're able to, to measure it in a more efficient way, in a more accurate way. But ADHD is an inattention, impulsivity, and expressive, excessive motor activity disorder that results in academic and social problems. In other words, it, it can have, there, and there are different forms of it, and this is just a very broad overview. If you're more interested in ADHD and more specific forms, you should take abnormal child psychology or um, child um, psychopathology, or you can also just, you know, look it up on the internet. But boys are more likely, or four times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than girls are. Part of this is because boys tend to be a lot more active, a lot more hyperactive, and so um, <clears throat> they're able, teachers tend to refer them more often because it tends to be, boys are already incredibly active, and so when they're, and when they're hyperactive, it just makes them stand out a lot more. White children are also 46 to 69 percent more likely to be diagnosed than black children. And this isn't because white children have ADHD more than black children, it's because black children tend to be diagnosed with conduct issues, conduct disorder, more than ADHD, when actually the reality is those children, those black children have ADHD, not a conduct disorder. And I, as a therapist, have seen, have seen this before, where you have a child who clearly has ADHD, um, but they, their, their records say conduct disorder, but you talk to them and you're like, there's no conduct disorder here, this is ADHD. This child literally cannot sit still while I'm trying to do therapy with them, they are, that's not a conduct issue. <laughs> it's really, it, and, you know, you laugh, but it's also awful. Um, teachers refer white children for testing for ADHD and they refer black children to detention, to suspension. Um, psychologists are equally complicit. We unfortunately diagnose white children with ADHD and black children with conduct disorder. So it's, it's really frustrating um, and, and racist, to be honest. Um, not to you know, beat around the bush, it's racist. Um, it's implicitly racist, whether we realize it or not. Um, there are a lot of bad academic and social outcomes that result from having ADHD. Um, children with ADHD tend to score 7 to 15 points lower on IQ tests, not because they're not intelligent, but if you've ever taken an IQ test, it requires intense concentration, the ability to um, self-regulate, um, the ability to do things quickly and efficiently, and children with ADHD cannot do any of those things because they have, they're, they have a deficit in their attention and they're hyperactive. Um, 
And as a result, they have harder times in schools and lower academic self-efficacy. Not because they're not smart, but because they have trouble working within the framework, a framework of education that's not designed for children with ADHD. They also have behavioral problems. If you're hyperactive, it's hard for you to sit still. It's hard for you to obey the teacher or to obey your parents. When it comes to ADHD, the, the good news is there, there are treatments available for ADHD that work very, very efficiently. Um, and what we would recommend is a combination of stimulant drug treatment, so a, a drug like Ritalin, um, which helps to maintain the attention and hyperactivity, <clears throat> which doesn't make sense. You're like, why would you stimulate someone who's already like overstimulated? Well, the reality is the overstimulation comes from the fact that they're actually not stimulated. You know how when you're tired, you're super tired, you get kind of hyperactive? That's why. Um, you're, you, need, you need more energy and your body reacts by like overcompensating um, for, because of the deficit. So actually stimulants do a world of good. Psychoeducation is the other thing that you would want to combine, so teaching people with ADHD how to adapt their learning, how to adapt their social interactions to, um, to having ADHD, and then family intervention, so getting the parents involved, educating them about the proper way to discipline their child, to help their child adapt to their ADHD. And also just to cope, because it can be really hard if you're a parent and you have a child with ADHD, um, it's, it's unfair and, and ridiculous that we that we have this mindset, but people often say that parents are often will, will judge people who have children with ADHD and think that they're bad parents or that they're not doing a good job, when the reality is they're doing the best they can. Their child has a, has a disability, has a disorder. And so having intervention to help parents cope is also really important. <clears throat> Lastly, during middle childhood, we see something develop called theory of mind. And theory of mind is this set of ideas about our mental activities. Um, and the theory of mind proposes that the mind is an active, constructive agent that selects and transforms information. In other words, our mind is not like an empty glass being filled up with water. We are, our mind is an active organism that is working and, and taking in information and interpreting it and thinking about it and creating new things based on that information. And this theory proposes that mental inferences, so our ability to mentally come up with explanations, logical explanations for things that we observe, is the way that we gain knowledge. Within the theory of mind, we also become aware of false beliefs. The idea that people believe things that aren't true because of, 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 of illogical or faulty mental um, inferences. For example, there are people, and this is hard for me to wrap my mind around, but there are people in the world who actually believe that the earth is flat. Despite the fact that we have pictures of the Earth being a globe, there are people who think that the Earth is flat, and they think that Antarctica is a glacial wall surrounding the edges of the Earth to keep the water from flowing off the edge of it. People believe that. That is a false belief. It's based on the inference that because we don't see curves on the Earth, the Earth cannot possibly be a, a sphere. Um, and it does not take into account the psychological things that happen in our brain when we observe the edge, the edge of the earth um, that our mind automatically reconstitutes what is in fact a, a, a bend, a dip we, creates it into a straight perspective forward. If you've ever been to the ocean, then you can tell that the Earth is, in fact, um, round. Because you watch the sun setting, the sun literally um, disappears. It literally goes away. Um, but you know that 
in the distance, there are still people experiencing the sun. And so there's no way to, like, there, you can't, there's no way to rationale how uh, uh, the Earth could not be round, in fact. And, and everybody on the Earth not experience night at the same time. So that's a false belief. But we're also able to, here I, I cannot believe I just spent like five minutes pr trying to demonstrate how the Earth is not flat. You, you would think that in 2017 we would no longer have this issue, but apparently we do. Um, we're also able to construct what's called second order false beliefs. So that's our false belief about somebody else's false belief. Um, which, that, that is an entirely different level of complexity um, that we will not talk about because I don't know that, that you could wrap your head around it. I know I can barely do so. Um, the last thing about theory of mind that the theory proposes is that we have awareness in middle childhood of differences in interpretation. So children in this period are able to think about um, the fact that different people think differently and interpret the world differently than themselves. Somehow that ability to understand that people have differences in interpretation can morph itself into judgments about the fact that people interpret the world differently, but we're not talking about that because that's not what this class is about. But that, that is interesting, right? That we can, we can make this leap from being aware of different interpretations to then making judgments about people who have different interpretations. All right, thanks for your attention today. I said this would be a 15-minute class, and it was a full class, so sorry. <laughs> um, today, uh, for tomorrow, I want you to read pages 309 to 325, and I want you to think about this question. Are intelligence tests culturally biased? What implications would cultural bias have on the results of such tests? So we will have, uh, we will have a discussion on IQ testing tomorrow. Um, and then remember that our midterm exam is Friday, and so and we're having an re exam review on Thursday, so read the information on Blackboard regarding that so that you're um, up to speed on what you need to be doing. Remember that if you haven't taken the quiz yet, and you, there's at least one person who hasn't, the quiz, quiz 2 is due tonight at 11.59 p.m. You will get a zero if it's not in by tonight, so please make sure that you take care of that. All right, I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good day. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns at darcy.corbett, C-O-R-B-I-T-T, -T, Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, at ndsu.edu. See you tomorrow.